Welcome to Programming with KBIS Part 1. My name is Antonio Lain, I'm the founder of KBIS Labs. In this talk, we are going to cover first the component model, and then we will show you the Cloud Assistant, that is our core abstraction. Then we will make this Cloud Assistant autonomous and show you how to interact with it with the client library. In Part 2, we will cover how Cloud Assistants interact with each other using the Trusted Bus, and two communication abstractions built on top of that bus, the Share Map and Publish Subscribe. And then we will finish that talk describing why the framework is three-way isomorphic and how we integrate devices. So then the component model was inspired by both the SmartFrog framework and the Erlang OTP libraries. In KBGS, we build everything with hierarchies of components. And today we are going to show you four things. First, how to create these hierarchies of components. Second, how to ensure that they are always healthy. Third, how to find the components that you want within that hierarchy. And finally, we will look at how we describe these hierarchies using JSON. A component is, is built with an asynchronous factory method. So why asynchronous? Because we don't want to block the main loop. So for example, we could have thousands of components in the same Node.js process. And when, when we want to create a new component, sometimes we have to do a lookup in Redis or in other external services to find some properties that are needed to configure that component. And of course, in that case, the last thing we want is that we have to stop the world. Why a factory method? Because we want to be able to swap implementations without modifying code. So for example, the core abstractions in KBJS are almost a hundred different components that is spread across many different repositories. And they all use my logger component. But if you don't like it, you can write your own and then swap it with a single line of JSON. And that is the power of having a component model. Even though creation is asynchronous, the order in which we create that hierarchy is always deterministic. So we do that left to right for siblings, and then we always create the, the parent after their children. The top component is always a little bit different because we always assume it's there. When we destroy the hierarchy, what we do is we reverse the order. So why we do that? We want to use creation order to be able to enforce dependencies between components so that a component can depend on other components being up and running during its creation. So how do we maintain that hierarchy of components healthy? So we all, we all have been in a situation in which we have a container that is responding okay to health checks, but unfortunately internally is completely brain dead. And the reason for that is because the checking is shallow. We don't really check all the functionality internal when we respond to that health check. In KBGS, we avoid that problem by ensuring that checks are always deep because a parent always periodically checks the health of its children. So what happens when a parent finds a fault or a missing child? There are three recovery strategies. It can either shut down all of them and restart them again or it could just restart the one that failed 
or you could just ignore the failure. But no matter what it does, in some cases, the failures will keep on coming. And at one point, it will realize that it cannot really recover the system, and then the error will just simply bubble up because the parent will fail. And when that error eventually hits the, the top level component, the process exits, and then at that point, Kubernetes takes over and restarts the container somewhere else. And that's our key recovery strategy. How do we actually navigate the hierarchy? Finding siblings is very simple because we, we share with them a context called this dot dollar. But if you want to find a component that is not a sibling, the topmost visible component that you are allowed to access is always using underscore in that context. But application code is a little bit different because we don't want application code to navigate the internals of the framework or the cloud assistant. So instead, what we do is we populate the this dollar context with security proxies that internally will forward actions to the real components within the hierarchy. For example, when you access the, the logger, you access it with this dot dollar dot log, but internally is using the underscore to find within that hierarchy the actual real logger component. And we write uh, CAVJS internals in a functional style to make sure that all these links are actually safe and never can be exposed to application code. How do we actually describe these hierarchies with JSON? A component has five properties. One is its name, and its name is the one that we use to register in the this dot dollar context so other siblings can find it. Then we have the module, and the module is basically a hint of how to find the factory method that creates this component. Then we have a, a description, and the description is useful because in JSON you can have comments. And then a bunch of properties that what we are going to do with these properties is to pass them at construction time to the object. And of course, a parent component could have other children components in an array, in the array components, and, and the whole hierarchy will be created recursively. So how do we define properties? Well, the simplest way to do that is by using properties that read from the environment, for example, log level here. Now, if that pro property is not defined in the environment, what we do is we, we provide a default value, in this case, debug. Default values and properties use JSON stringify strings. And um, that allows us to have arbitrarily complex data structures within a property. But there is an exception. We don't want to double quote the strings all the time because that's that's actually a pain. So what we do is when JSON parsing fails, we assume that that was a string and that avoids us to having to quote every single string. The other way of creating values for properties is to, to link to properties in the top level. And, and why is that useful? Because when we create a hierarchy, we can also override the properties that are at the top level. And if the internal components link to the top level, what happens is that we don't have to understand the internal structure, uh, the internal structure of, of the hierarchy in order to provide properties to these inner components. 
but in practice you don't create a hierarchy from scratch you tend to use another description as a template and what you do is at that point is just override a few attributes and modify a few things on, on it so the way we do that is to create another file that has the same name but plus plus dot json and then we provide as the skeleton of a, of a delta that we want to apply and merge into the original de description. So for example, in this case, we are going to modify the pro property log level of the log component that we just defined a moment ago. Using the same idea, we can also delete a component by setting the module to null or also we can insert a component anywhere we want within an array. So how do we actually define the insertion point? Typically what, what happens is we use the insertion point to be just after the last element that was touched or modified by a, a previous insertion or modification. So that's why you will see this this pattern that I'm showing you here, in which you have a touch operation, just define the insertion point, and then you will add the real new component that will be inserted after the log component. So there's much more to learn about the component model. In particular, it's quite important to look at the default hierarchies for the framework itself, for a default cloud assistant, and also for Kavji Slide. And, and you can also build your own. So have a look at the documentation for further info. Now let's look at the cloud assistant. That is our core abstraction. We started with an actor. An actor like the ones from the actor model implemented in Erlang or ACA. And an actor provides first a location independent name. And then it has a little bit of a state. Think about kilobytes. But as I'm going to show you in a moment, we are extremely careful on how we manage that state. It also has a local queue to serialize the requests and it interacts with other cloud assistant in a completely asynchronous manner. So a, a Hello World cl cloud assistant looks like this. And it's always defined in a file called ca underscore methods.js. Think about it as our main program, right? And what this file, def file defines is a mixing of methods that will be merge into the core implementation of a cloud assistant. Methods can be either internal when they actually are prefixed by underscore underscore CA underscore. And these are only called by the framework itself. But there are all the other methods will be external. For example, get counter here. And they're directly called by the client library. Methods in both cases are always asynchronous and they always return an array. In fact, a tuple array in which some of these elements of the tuple could be missing. But the first element of the tuple will always be an error, an application level error that is returned to the user. And the second element will be the actual value that we return. To initialize this cloud assistant, we always call caveats init. But as, as you see here, we also pass the module. Why that? Because that makes it much easier for the framework to find other descriptions and other resources that share the same directory as this file. In caveats, we take serialization to the next level and make it a global property that is cluster-wide. 
So you can have hundreds of Node.js processes across many different servers, but at most one active CA is all, it has a particular given name. And serialization of a request, as I'm going to show you in a moment, it could also spawn multiple asynchronous steps. So why is this important? Let's look at the function increment that let's assume that it was supposed supposedly going to give you a different value every time you call it. And unfortunately, this function increment will not work at all in a framework like Express. Why? Because there is a race. So imagine that one request comes in, increments the counter, and then it starts waiting in the in the timeout. And then while that request is still in the timeout, another request comes in and increments the counter. When the, the first request exits the timeout, it will read the current counter with get counter. But the current counter has already been implemented in incremented twice. So that means that the value that you return will be the same one as the, as the next request, breaking our uniqueness property. Now, in, in Kavya.js, we don't have that problem because we have a, this queue and this global property of serialization that ensures that the second request, we will not start executing un until the first one is fully done. Now, why is this critical in my mind? Because races tend to happen when you stress the code, mostly in production. And also these days with async await, it's so easy to add asynchronous code and potentially add trouble to your, to your code that it's becoming more and more important to provide mechanisms to avoid races. The other thing that is different from cloud assistance to a traditional actor model is that the changes to the private state are transactional. So the scope of a, that transaction could be one request, but as I, I just show you, it could spawn multiple asynchronous steps. So what does it mean to be transactional? So for example, if we return an error or we throw an exception, we will roll back all the state changes that we did during the processing of that request. But on the other hand, if everything goes fine, we will commit these changes after we checkpoint in external service, in our case, Redis. So that simplifies quite a bit how to handle errors. So in, in KVS, we think about two types of errors, application errors and unrecoverable errors. Application errors are the ones that are returned as the first element of that tuple array. But unrecoverable errors are typically just thrown exceptions. We assume that your code knows best what to do with application errors. So we try not to mess with them too much and just pass them to you. But unrecoverable errors are assumed to be difficult to handle by everybody. And the way we manage them are, is also very different in the client library, as I'm going to show you in a moment. But in both cases, what we do is that the cloud system will always about the transaction and then roll back all the state changes that it did. So for example, in this case, we have this in, in increment function. And let's say that we pass a string as opposed to a number to that increment function. And that check, the conditional check will, will fail, but then we actually try to increment the counter with a string. Of course, that's not going to go well 
and we ended up with something that is not going to be a number. So we will throw that exception here. Now, what happens here is that if you had a, most other frameworks like Express, the internal state of that cloud assistant will be corrupted forever because the counter has been modified to have a, a string as opposed to a value. But here, what we do is we, as, a, as we mentioned a moment ago, we, we will abort the transaction and then roll back changes so that we return that error to the, to the client, but we are capable of continuing to work as, as usual. The other important different property of the cloud assistance is that we always enforce external consistency. So the, the private state that is internal to the cloud assistant is always consistent with external commitments. So for example, if we modify the state and send a message to someone that kind of reflects that new state, and then the server crashes, we guarantee that when we come back, our internal state will be consistent with whatever we told the world our state was going to be. So how can we do that? Well, the key is to delay externalization and after we have a, a commit that is stable into, a, in our case, Redis, that re reflects all these changes. And in order to do that, we have to delay externalization. Now, how do, how do we do that? We use transactional plugins to interact with the external world. And another important property of these plugins is that they also make retrying ex external operations safe. So for example, in some cases, they will check whether that operation was already performed before attempting to do it again. Now, what happens if there is a failure? If there is a failure, we will reload the, the checkpoint from Redis. And then at that point, we will redo all the pending actions that we were supposed to have done. Now, one of the most important properties of the transactional plugins is that they combine nicely with each other within a transaction. So how do we do that? So what we do is we implement internally a two-phase commit protocol. This is not a distributed transaction, but think about a two-phase protocol that is local but on the other hand, has a remote checkpoint. So let's give you an example of how all this works. So we have um, a transactional plugin called Session that is used to send a notification to the client. And in this case, what happens is that we could have a situation in which the counter exceeds 100 and then instead of returning a normal value, we will return an error. And as I just mentioned, when we return an error, we abort the transaction and then roll back changes. So the, the counter will go back to 100. Now, unfortunately, we have already told the world that the, the counter was 101, but no worries. In our case, we not only roll back the changes to the state, we also ensure that that notification will never happen because it was delayed until commit. There's much more to learn about cloud assistance and I, I definitely encourage you to have a look at the, at the documentation. Now let's look at how to make the cloud assistant autonomous. To make it 
autonomous is very, very straightforward. The only thing you need is to create a, a pulse message and that pulse message will be periodically called by the framework itself, even if there was no other external activity. But autonomous is not enough. So you also have to have a way in which you can notifi not notify clients that are offline of something important that happened while they were away. And we do that in CapGJS with notification queues for offline clients. The idea is that the client will pick up a session name and typically you want that name to be easy to remember. Why is that? Because by typing the same name in a different device, it can basically have continuity across different devices and your notifications will just simply go with you. Or in other cases, you might want to have different names because you want to certain devices to listen to certain notifications. Now, what happens is the queues themselves are always selected by the session name. And of course, the, the problem you can have is that if nobody reads these messages, the queue could keep on growing and growing until your cloud system runs out of memory. So to avoid that, we, we make sure that the user code actually can have control over the growth of that queue during the autonomous execution of the cloud system. So let me show you an example. So here we, we define a pulse method, method and then every so often is going to send a notification. And the notification is going to send to a, a session that has chosen the session name admin. Of course, if nobody is connected at the time, it will just get queued in the cloud with a with a queue that is associated with, with the name admin. And then later on, when the client connects, it will get the, all the dispending notifications. But in this case, we are limiting the size of the queue to one. So that means that we only keep the last one. In some cases, we want to send notifications to many clients of that cloud assistant. And we might not know beforehand exactly who these clients are or how many they are. And But we want to make sure that each of them get one of them. And we do that by using two tricks. One is to use regular expressions to describe sessions. And the other is to use on-demand creation of queues. So in this case, for example, we use a regular exp expression to define a, all this, to match all the session names that start with admin. And then when we notify, we will look at all the current queues and all of them that match that prefix will get its own notification. And how do we actually create these queues? Well, every time that a client interacts with the cloud assistant, for example, by calling get counter, if they have chosen a session name that is, let's say, admin one, if that queue was not created, it will be created by default. Of course, the problem is that you could run out of memory, right? If, if you keep on creating queues, so there is some settings that you can have in your in your configuration to ensure that both the number of queues and also the number of messages per queue are bounded. So sessions can be also used to help clients to recover after failures using something we call persistent sessions. And, and we we really encourage you to have a look at that in, in the documentation. The client library, our last part in this talk. The client library is uh, is tiny. 
and it just needs WebSocket support. And because of that, it runs well in the browser, it runs on the cloud, it runs well for the scripts that you can write, and also in embedded devices. So we try to make it a universal way of interacting with cloud assistance. And the functionality that it provides is three major features. One is authentication. The other one is a request response paradigm that we are all familiar with. And, and the last one is streams of notifications coming from your cloud assistant. So let's start with authentication. What we do is we embed a JSON web token within the URL. And these tokens are self-describing and they are signed by the account service. And because the, the public key associated with that service is always injected in every single application when we de deploy that application in the KBS cloud, these applications can locally validate tokens. They don't have to go anywhere else to do that. Tokens are typically short-lived and in order to make it easy to manage short leaf certificates, we provide a service in the launcher app, again, with another cloud assistant that will manage all your tokens for you and ensure they are all ready when you need them. We implement single sign-on and we emphasize that we avoid the man in the middle attacks. And the way we avoid these attacks is by using attenuated to tokens. The API to, to weaken a token is particularly clean because all our tokens form a mid semi lattice. Let me give you an example of how to use these, these tokens. In KBS, we borrow an idea from Microsoft Orleans that in order to create a cloud assistant, there's no explicit function or, or method to call it. But the first time that you actually access it, it gets created. Or if it was hibernated, it will be bring back from hibernation. But the difference with Microsoft Orleans is that in our case, when you create a cloud assistant, there's a subscription associated with that cloud assistant that kicks in. And of course, someone is paying for it, right? So you want to make sure that only the owner of that cloud assistant can create it or bring it back from hibernation. So how do we actually enforce this property? So in, in the URL, we have the from field and the CA field. The CA is the target. And we always name everything using local namespaces under the owner. So for example, foo-ca1 just means that the owner foo has named the cloud assistant as CA1. Now, when the from and the CA are the same, that means that you are acting as the owner. And then of course you, you can create it on demand. But in order for you to be able to claim that from, now you need a token. And what this token does is basically will have both the application that it refers to, in this case, root hyphen hello, but also the name of the cloud assistant that you are supposed to, to create, that is full hyphen CA1. We also, as you, as, you, as you see, we also name applications based on the publisher. In this case, hello application was published by root. So let's look at the, a simple request response paradigm with the, with, the client, with the client library. So what we will do is we, we use uh, the, the URL and the URL helps you to create a session object. 
And then once that session object is created, the result is very similar to what you will have when you create a WebSocket. So you will have an unopened uh, handler that will be called after creating that session. But once you create a session, there's some magic that happens behind the scenes. So if you see here, suddenly the session has now the methods increment and get counter. So where these methods came, can come from? Well, what happens is that when we contact the cloud assistant, some metadata that was extracted from the code gets shipped to the client and then the client can create all these methods on the fly. Now, what about error handling? As, as I just mentioned, there's two types of errors, the application level errors, and also there is unrecoverable errors. So application level errors are in this case handled in line because what they do is they reject the promise and because we are doing an await, it will just throw an exception. On the other hand, an unrecoverable error, what it does is basically close a session by calling the onClose handler. And it basically returns that error within the onClose argument. At that point, of course, you can no longer use the session. On the other hand, in the other case, you could continue using the same session because the session itself will not get affected by the error. What about streams of notifications? It's kind of a straightforward. So you, you, you only have to add session name to the URL. And then once you have defined the name that matches the notification queue in the, of the cloud assistant, then you also have to define an on-message handler. And this on-message handler will receive the request and will be able to extract from that request the arguments that originally the cloud assistant passed to the notify method. L let me summarize what we have seen today. We first look at the component model and in particular how to build these hierarchies of components using asynchronous factory methods but at the same time, maintaining the order in which we create these components so that we can enforce dependencies. Then we look at how to ensure that these components are healthy at all times, how to navigate these hierarchies, and how to describe them using JSON descriptions. Then we look at the cloud assistant or core abstraction, and first, the roots of the cloud assistant in the actor model. But then a few things are different from the traditional actor model. First, that serialization is a global property that is cluster wide. Second, that we manage the internal state of the cloud assistant with transactions. And third, that we always guarantee that the internal state of the cloud assistant is consistent with its external commitments. Then we look at how to make this cloud assistant autonomous by defining a pools method and how to manage notifications for offline clients using our session plugin. And then finally, we look at the client library and in particular authentication, the request response model and managing streams of notification for our, from our cloud assistant. There's plenty more information in the website and many examples and apps in GitHub. And we also have the KBS Cloud that for very little money will deploy your app and scale based on how many cloud assistants you are currently running. We would love to hear from you. So send us email or follow us on Twitter. And thanks for listening.